Good afternoon. I'm talking on the free society, its enemies and its friends. First of all, I would like to uh, talk about or ask who are the enemies of a free society. After we have clarified that, uh, I want to talk about the silent societal transformation uh, that is going on starting um, from these enemies. And um, the overall title, title is, is freedom. So what are the benefits of freedom? Why is freedom important? And how can we help freedom to survive? And at the end, I will give a, a very short outline saying um, something about the crossroads between freedom and chaos. So um, the resources or the sources uh, that I use, you can find in the outline. And um, also for the German uh, speaking people, um, you can have a look at my book, Die Freie Gesellschaft und Ihre Feinde, that describes much more than I can say here in this time. So let's start with the free society and its enemies. Um, <clears throat> I, first of all, I want to talk about the fight of today's ideologies. Then I want to highlight the deadliest ideology of the 20th century, talk about Karl Marx and his creative great-grandchildren and ideology as a substitute for religion. And then I will give the thesis that is guiding the talk. Now, uh, what are the ideologies that are fighting today? Um, mainly in Europe, but uh, also um, in much of the Western world. And um, this is the global financial revolution, which is not really an ideology, but which is, of course, making uh, big impacts on our lives. Then there is uh, liberal worldviews, there are conservative worldviews, there, are, there is Islam, um, there is right-wing extremism, and there is socialism. And of course, there are Christians, and it seems that Christians are forming a sort of a silent, uh, silent um, minority, and that I've called the silence of the lambs. So all this is shaping our continent, and what I want to be talking about here is, the, is uh, what I've called socialism. Uh, because I think socialism is forming a cultural revolution, which is hardly noticed by some Christians or by many Christians. And I want to highlight what is really going on and to give you a clue to interpret what is going on in our society. So uh, let me talk first about the last century, the deadly ideologies of the last century. Uh, Rudolf Rommel, um, a, politician, uh, a political scientist, has termed uh, the expression democide. Democide is the intentional killing of an unarmed person or people by governments or by regimes. Now, if we look at the last century, we find something like this. Uh, the bloodiest uh, democide mega murderers are shown here. So um, top of the list is um, Stalin and Mao Zedong, and we can discuss who is really on top of the list. Um, then is followed by Adolf Hitler, by Chiang Kai-shek, by Lenin, Hideki, Pol Pot, and so on. So the list goes on. And the mega murderers are people who killed more than one million people. So there are a few more, but I think that's enough um, uh, for this context. And if we look at the mega murderer regimes, then we find, of course, it corresponds to the mega murderers. So the, US, the former USSR, we have 60 million people killed in China. We have probably more than 70 million people killed in Germany, 20 million in China, 10 million by the Kuomintang, and so on goes the list. Com Cambodia is well known with this 2 million um, people killed. Um, so what we find here is a conglomerate of horror. Um, and uh, the uh, four people who have killed more than 10 million people are the Deka mega murderers, um, as Rommel, uh, Rommel would, call him, uh, would call them, which is uh, Stalin, Mao Zedong, Hitler, and Chiang Kai-shek. And the corresponding regi regimes are the former USSR, China, Germany, and the Kuomintang, China. So, um, this is a fairly, uh, there are, there's a fairly long list that has been collected by Rommel. Other people have also collected lists about victims. There's a very famous book of Stephen Courtois and many other authors, The Black Book of Communism, 
he just estimated numbers, so they are very different from the ones that Rummel gave. But um, <clears throat> the Black Book of Communism is very uh, interesting to read because it describes all the mechanisms that were going on. Now, of course, there is this discussion about these numbers, are they higher or lower or something like that, but you see the order of magnitude and you see the size um, of murder that was going on there. And if we sum all that up, then we find that communism has been the most deadly single ideology in the 20th century. Approximately 150 million people have been killed by democide um, by communism. So democide means not killed by direct war uh, action, one soldier against another, but people who have, ki have been killed who could not um, defend themselves. This is a huge amount of, of victims that communism has to bear. And um, uh, Rommel has, has made a very thorough analysis about many different dictatorships and regimes. And the result that he comes up with is fairly simple. He says, power kills. And absolute power kills absolute, and that is true for any kind of regime. Now, um, Jesus said something very um, substantial uh, with respect to this observation. Um, he said in, in Matthew 20, you know about the rulers of the nations. They hold power over the people and the high officials order them around. Don't be like that. Instead, anyone who wants to be important among you must be your servant. So there is servant leadership and there is dictatorship leadership, and that's uh, quite a different thing. And um, very few people um, manage to uh, go about in a good way with, with a lot of power. So power kills, absolute power kills absolute, uh, as Rommel said. Now, um, where does communism come from? I have a very coarse grain structure here, which might, might help us to get an idea and to bridge the, um, the situation from the classical communism to uh, what we have today. Um, the idea is always how to create a new just world. And classical Marxism says, okay, there's a struggle um, for the means of production and there must be a violent revolution up to the dictatorship of the pro proletariat. Um, the neo-Marxism from the Frankfurt School, which was very active in Germany before and then, of course, mainly after the war, uh, after the war, said we have to change the culture of a society to bring about a revolution. Um, why that is the case, I will show in a minute. And um, then these ideas have developed further and further. What is called the post-Marxist left, um, they would say, okay. Um, we use actual or supposed injustice for revolution. We use suppressed minorities. We use colonialism, inequalities, queer ideology, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Which is important that it does not mean there are no injustice, injustices. There are, of course, injustices. But the question is, do you use these injustices to um, go into the direction of revolution? Or do you really care about the uh, injustices and try to heal these injustices. And if we look at today, it, it appears that um, left politics has become a substitution for religion. There's sort of a purification of consciousness through moral superiority. I will show in a minute what that means. So um, what we have today is sort of a class struggle 2.0. Um, the class, the classical class struggle, so to say, 1.0 is um, there is a liberation of the oppressed working class through a revolution. That's a classical uh, communist theme. And um, the creation of a revolutionary consciousness of the working class has to happen through the party, through the communist party. Now, there's a problem. The working class today has a row house, a Mercedes, and is on vacation in Mallorca. So, the working class is not really suitable for a revolution. The solution is class struggle 2.0. So uh, many oppressed minorities are needed. Women, although they are not a minority, low wage earners, unemployed refugees, LBTQ plus, and so on and so on. And the task of left politics is now to make the oppressed aware of their oppression and use alleged or actual injustice to reshape the society. Um, 
I will give another, uh, I will give one example that is uh, very prominent in today's discussion, uh, this really discussion in these days, weeks and months that is going on, that is identity politics. And that is replacing arguments by emotions. Um, a German um, uh, scientist, Sander Kostner, has written a book, Identitätslinke Leutungsagenda, which I can recommend very much to you. Um, that has laid the foundation um, for, this, um, for this discussion. And um, identity politics is something that says your identity as a person is defined through your belonging to a, to a minority. So if you are a refugee, then that is your identity, no matter whether you are a doctor or uh, whatever you are. Um, identity uh, is... Uh, uh, is, is where the group, the minority, where you belong to. And then it's saying um, minorities are always victims. And these victims, they have to be, they have to demand compensation because they are, uh, they, they are, they have uh, drawbacks and, they have, and these have to be compensated. On the other hand, there is a purification agenda. The majority society must repent for their privileges. And that can be done by providing support to victims, which may be financially or ideally, or purification through repentance. So the majority has to acknowledge its own wrongful status. Now, uh, this receipt uh, has uh, severe um, uh, uh, effects. Um, it keeps the victims passive because the victims are not told, okay, if you work hard, if you learn the language, if you are uh, whatever um, active, then you can change your situation, you can earn money, you can be whatever you want. But no, they are told you are victims and you have to demand a compensation. So they are kept passive. And on the other hand, the majority, which is a priori guilty, feels unfair, unfair trade, uh, treated because they say, why should someone be in a better position than we? We also have to earn our money. Um, so they feel uh, unfairly uh, treated. And um, the point is there is no end inside. Um, more and more structural discrimination is found and uh, the more discrimination is found, the more re re regulation is required, the more quota and so on and so on. So it's a game that is never ending and is deeply dividing our society. Now, um, Karl Popper, the great philosopher of the 20th, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, has called this behavior a revolt against reason. Of course, he did not yet know identity politics, but it's just one example. And what he says is very fundamental. He's saying the abandonment of the rationalist attitude, of the respect for reason and argument and the other fellow's point of view the stress upon the deeper, so emotional layers of human nature, all this must lead to the view that thought is merely a somewhat superficial manifestation of what lies uh, within or behind these irrational depths. And then he says the consequence is, it must nearly always, I believe, produce an attitude which considers the person of the thinker instead of his thought. And that's exactly what we see today. If you say something that is not mainstream, then people do not argue about what you said, but say, oh no, he's only saying that because he's white or male or European or whatever it is. And so the thought is wiped away by just talking about the person who says it. And um, then he further concludes, it must produce the belief that we think with our blood or we think with our national heritage or we think with our class. And once we have done this, political equilitarianism becomes practically impossible. So democracy becomes impossible because this abandoning of rational arguments that opens the path for fascism, nationalism, and communism, and other isms, but not for democracy. Now, um, the, uh, the development goes in a direction that ideology uh, is a substitute for faith, and I would call that a gospel of guilt. Why? Um, there are two main Trojan horses today. Um, one is the politics of fear, and fear is put in the hearts of people through the development of climate change. They stop 
say, stop global heating, we are the last generation. So they, they tell the young generation they are the last generation. So if that is the case, then everything is permitted because it's an urgent situation and whatever you do is okay. Um, and the second Trojan horse is the ideology, ideological moral guilt complex, I would call it. So if you are European, if you are German, if you're Christian, if you're white, if you're heterosexual, if you're male and so on, then you are guilty. And as soon as you open your mouth and say something critical, then it doesn't matter because you are guilty. So your arguments don't count. And that's the foundation of irrationalism in the, in the public discussion. And there is sort of an original sin that comes in that says, oh, whoever lives is guilty. Why? Because life consumes energy, pollutes, pollutes the environment, uh, there is no escape. So the less people there are, the better it is. Um, but um, there is an atonement. And the atonement is showing the correct attitude. So using the appropriate language as a gesture of submission. So by the way you talk, that's especially in German, in the German language is very pronounced. Um, if you use a special language, then you show your uh, atonement, you show your appreciation and uh, you, you surrender and what is necessary. And what is necessary seems to be a, a socialism without alternatives and it's sort of an eco-socialism. It's um, the narrowing of all possibilities down to one solution and not looking at many solutions, but only at one solution and saying, okay, this is the way we have to go. So this is a gospel of guilt. Why? The spiral is spinning on and spinning on. This is an indulgence trade without indulgence. There is no escape and there is no freedom in there. So the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells, which is also a dream of socialists, is never achieved because it's done with the wrong measures, because it's not, act, it's not realized that man itself is guilty in their heart and can have um, redemption. But redemption comes from political um, uh, structures which have to be followed and have, which have to be submitted to. So, um, at that point, it may be good to have some sort of definitions. What do I call an ideology? I call an ideology, uh, ideologies, ideas and worldviews that are not based on evidence and good arguments, but that are essentially aiming to stabilize or change power relations. So it's a matter of power that we are talking about, not a matter of truth. And what is left? I follow the, uh, the definition of Roger Scruton, who has written a very interesting book, Fools, Frauds, and Firebrands. And he says, the basic idea of left thinking is that the goods of this world are unjustly distributed and that the fault of this lies not in the human nature, but in the wrongful possessions practiced by a dominant class. Of course, there is something uh, right in this, but it's not right that there is no problem in the human nature. There is a problem in the human nature. And that can only be overcome by Christ and not by political measures. So what we are dealing with is an ideology with many names and packages. You can name it Marxism, scientific materialism, communism, socialism, democratic socialism, eco-socialism, liberating tolerance, or whatever you want. Um, the basic idea behind is the same. So my thesis of the talk is that left socialist ideology is destroying the foundations of Christian faith and our society through a creeping transformation in the direction of an authoritarian system. Um, how does it work? How does this transformation work? It's a more or less silent societal transformation and it has three steps. It has manipulation, destabilization and transformation. So what about manipulation? Manipulation is a targeted and covert influence to control the experience and behavior of individuals or groups in which the goals should remain hidden. So if you go to a secondhand car dealer, then you know the secondhand car dealer will sell you a car. And if he talks about that car, you know what he wants. So it's not a manipulation, it's advertising. But if someone talks to you and he does not tell you what his real goal is, then it's manipulation. And there are lots of means of political manipulation. The first is conceal what you don't want people to know, so they can't complain. 
if you can't conceal it, emotionalize it and defame the person who give another statement than you want to be given. And then you can use force or violence. Uh, that's the business of the Antifa. Um, or you can control thinking and that's the business of uh, mainstream newspapers and all that leads to an interpreted, uh, interpretative sovereignty. And this uh, sovereignty, this interpretative sovereignty is crippling at the moment and that's a good thing. Now, second step, destabilization. Uh, the Frankfurt School put a huge emphasis on uh, destabilize religion and culture. Why? Because the cultural identity and especially Christianity gives people a solid uh, uh, ground for their convictions and for their stability in life. So uh, you have to get rid of Christianity for a, uh, for a, a revolution. The society itself has to be split in, um, in envying parts that can be done by identity politics, by political correctness, and by the threat of violence or the use of violence. Family structures um, are, uh, the Frankfurt School always talks about that family transports um, a, a, sub, a submissive mind. So if you want to um, get a hold of the children, you have to take the children out of the family and you have to destroy the family, otherwise the family would just um, continue to um, uh, to try uh, to uh, transport um, these um, uh, these structures of obedience and so on. Personality um, is uh, you have to foster hedonism, sexual liberation, and also confusion of sexual identity. So the last step is the transformation. The influence you have to strengthen the influence of government. Um, strengthen bureaucracy, regulations, quotas, expropri expropriation, something that is discussed very heavily these days, um, leveling down by redistribution of income and lowering the standards of education. This is what we clearly see. And um, then pathologize opponents, talk about homo, trans, xeno, Islamophobia and so on, or just talk about conspiration, conspiracy theory. If you say someone follows the conspiracy theory, you have to, you do not have to justify why you think it's a conspiracy theory, you just say it is one, you just claim it is one, and then um, uh, the argument is gone and nobody cares about what has been said. Finally, you criminalize opponents by guilt, by association, by accusation of hatred or fundamentalism, these Christians are they are fundamentalists and you kind of cannot listen to them. And um, Finally, there is always um, a, a drive towards changing the law to subjective sort of crimes. So I feel discriminated and therefore you are guilty instead of saying there is an objective thing that has been done, something has been stolen, so there is a thief that can be traced. But if you say uh, the other one is guilty because I feel discriminated then the other one has to prove that he has not discriminated you. And this is a very difficult situation if it comes to the point. So um, we, I, I hope I could outline in a very short uh, way the, the transformation that is going on. And um, some people say, okay, well, but is freedom so important? Why don't we just submit to governments or to any kind of regulation? And it turns out that uh, freedom has uh, indeed very strong benefits which we should know. Um, and uh, for the, in order to, to work that out, there is a scale of freedom and its consequences. Um, and uh, there is uh, the effect uh, of what the enemies of freedom achieve and what the friends of freedom achieve. Now let's have a look at the, um, uh, at the uh, combination of freedom and prosperity in the uh, uh, economy. There is an economic freedom of the world index that classifies countries from O to zero um, for their uh, economic freedom. And uh, the criteria are such as uh, the extent of state influence and government regulation, um, the legal system, the stability of the legal system, the monetary stability and the freedom of trade and freedom of contract. Um, and all that enters in into this index. And the result is this. 
So uh, these 160 states, uh, which have been uh, investigated, are, separate, uh, are put into uh, four classes of uh, roughly 40 states each. And there are the most unfree states, the third free states, the second free states, and the most free states. And um, if you do it, then you find um, that there's a strong dependence uh, of freedom on the gross domestic product per capita. So in the free, in the very free states, you find a very high gross domestic product. In the most unfree, you find a very low one, and the factor is about eight. Um, now, examples are for the most unfree states. China is the most free states in the class of the most unfree states, and Venezuela is the most unfree state in the class of the most unfree states. Um, not all countries are covered. For example, North Korea is not covered because there are no economic data. If it would have been covered, it would be, certainly be uh, very low on the list. The third free countries are from Lebanon, Cuba, Togo. The second free countries from Norway, Uruguay, Poland as examples. And the most free countries, Switzerland is one of the most free countries. Germany is in the middle of the free countries and Israel is on the lower edge of the most free countries. And what you can see is, of course, there is a lot of scatter in these data, but what you can see, there's a very strong dependence. So the more freedom people have, the more uh, economy, the more prosperity and wealth is in the country. So on the other hand, um, poverty and terror, is this only an accident of socialism and communism? So some people say, oh, well, if you do socialism and communism right, then everything would be fine. But that has never been proven. The opposite has been proven. So the pattern of communism and poverty is you enforce equality. So you have to have a planned economy. If you want to have a planned economy, you have inefficiency. A planned economy is very inefficient as compared to markets. So you create poverty. And if you have poverty, you have to have an enforcement by dictatorship. And you have to use arbitrariness, terror, and oppression. So it's a, it's a very detrimental um, uh, circuit that is uh, going on here. And historically, it, always, it has always led to poverty. So poverty and dictatorship are necessary consequences of, con of communism. Now, um, the pattern of communism and terror is a um, is very similar one. Uh, I just take one example. That's the overthrow of the last Tsar. Uh, of Russia by the communist revolution. This Tsar was obviously a very bad ruler. He made bad decisions, which cost a lot of their people, of, of his own people, their lives. And um, the Tsar regime between 19 and 1917 has killed around 1.1 million people by democide, uh, according to Rommel. And then um, that was enough reason to turn him over. And uh, there was a guy called Lenin who did that. And the promise was now everything is going to be better. What actually happened is that Lenin killed in the same time span about 4 million people. And after Lenin came Stalin and Lenin killed more than 40 million people. So all in all in the USSR, around 60 million people have been killed. And although the Tsar was a bad ruler, what came after that was not better as promised, but was just much worse. And that's the, the typical situation that communists turn a bad situation in an extremely bad situation and not in a better situation. So um, at the end, you have a much worse solution, so to say. And uh, Winston Churchill once uh, said that um, in 1945, he said the inherent vice of capitalism is the unequal sharing of blessings and the inherent virtue of socialism is the equal sharing of miseries. And um, that seems to be more or less true. Now, um, what about Christians? Are we friends of freedom? And I think we should be. Um, first, we have the command uh, that we should pray for all people, especially for politicians. Um, you can read that in 1 Timotheus, where it says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And then it says, um, we also should act for a good society. Uh, take, for example, uh, Jeremiah, where it says, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which you have been carried out into exile. Pray for the Lord to it, because if it prospers, 
you will also prosper. So our responsibility is not done with praying for people, although this is important, but it's uh, our responsibility is also to work for the good of society, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which you have, which I have carried you into exile. So even if you live in a situation which you don't like, God has put you there and he asked you uh, to do something for this community that it prospers, because if it prospers, you will prosper as well. There are a number of Christians um, who say, oh, I don't care about society, or I don't care, um, uh, that, doesn't, um, that doesn't concern me, but it will concern you because if everything around you goes down the drain, uh, then you will have a problem as well. So um, we as Christians, I think, have a very high responsibility of helping freedom to survive. And um, there are four points. Uh, first of all, we have to reclaim freedom of thought. Uh, then we have to break conformity. And then we have to speak with our full right. And the right is very strong on free speech and um, uh, 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 freedom of your own opinion, at least in Germany. I'm not sure about the other countries, but should be roughly the same. Um, and I will give some examples how that works out or that may work out. So, um, the first thing I think we have to do is reclaiming freedom of thought. And that's a biblical command. In Romans 12, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, good and pleasing, perfect will. So most of us will know this, um, this verse from Romans. Um, and uh, I will rephrase it in another way, which I think is quite illustrative, that comes from Alvin Plantinga. And Alvin Plantinga is um, one of the great Christian philosophers um, in the English speaking world and the American world. Um, and he uh, uh, has written a small um, article already in, in 84, um, advice to Christian philosophers. And he does not only speak to Christian philosophers, but he also speaks to to people like us who are academics or who have some sort of responsibility. And he says, so the Christian philosopher has his own topics and projects to think about. And when he thinks about the topics of current concern, he will think about them in his own way, which may be a different way. He may have to reject certain currently fashionable assumptions. And the Christian philosopher has a perfect right to the point of view and pre-philosophical assumptions he brings to philosophy work. The fact that these are not widely shared outside the Christian community is interesting, but fundamentally irrelevant. I find this statement really very uh, helpful because he says everybody brings his presuppositions into his work or into his arguing. So why should we at Christian, as Christians not do the same? We have the same right to bring our presuppositions in and start with them. And some Christians try to start with atheistic presuppositions and then they wonder why they don't come to a good result. That just doesn't work. So if we have reclaimed freedom of thought, then the next step comes. And that's the break uh, to break conformity. There's a very interesting experiment from Solomon Ash. It's, uh, Ash, it's fairly old uh, from the 50s. Um, and he uh, did the following experiment. Um, he asked test subjects to uh, assess the length of the lines. So you see three lines on the right. And the question was, which of these lines has the same length as the one on the left side? So it was not exactly that one, but a similar one. And um, the point is that it's fairly obvious what the right answer is. So there's not much, um, uh, not much uh, uh, fiddling around. It's quite clear it's the middle line that's the same length as the one on the left. Um, but the setting um, was that only that there was only one real test person and the other test fake test persons, they were instructed to give the wrong answers. So there were three or four test persons and they all were instructed to give the wrong answer. And the last poor guy, he was a real test person and uh, Ash wanted to find out how this test person reacts. And the result is fairly interesting. Um, the behavior of the instructed persons uh, when all were giving the wrong answer 
resulted in more than one third of the real test persons who gave an obviously wrong answer. So although the situation was quite clear, um, what, more than one third gave the wrong answer um, in an obvious situation. And then he changed the, uh, the situation a little bit and he instructed one of the fake test persons to give the correct answer and all the rest to give the wrong answer. And, and in this setting, um, there were only 5% of the test persons who gave the obviously wrong answer. And although the first result is a bit frightening, the second result is very encouraging. It means that if you sit in a lecture hall or if you sit uh, at, at some context and everybody is listening to the speaker or whatever uh, the situation is and everybody agrees and thinks, oh yeah, that's correct. Um, and you, uh, challenge this view or give another view or ask a question, then you can release the others also to think differently and also to be freed in their mind and to break the conformity that was in the lecture hall before. I've experienced that several times. Asking good questions to challenge is a good way to break conformity. So that's a thing, that's a thing a one single person can do. So then we can speak with our full right. People, um, some people have experienced pressure from student unions or representative, others uh, uh, are pressed by unwritten or unknown laws. So you have to know your rights. You have to know what you can do and what not. In order to um, enhance this knowledge, um, several evangelical alliances have written brochures uh, about this and have given advice, what is the, uh, the legal situation about free speech in their country? I don't know if there are more, I just found these ones. Um, so if you are unsure what you are sort of allowed to do, you can have a look. And um, uh, in, uh, uh, in autumn last year, um, Heiner Bielefeld, who was the former UN special representative on the freedom of religion, he said in a celebratory speech on the occasion of seven years of the student mission in Germany, um, he said in his speech, it is not the one who exercises fundamental rights who has to justify himself, but whoever restricts fundamental rights. And that is a very important statement. So if you exercise fundamental rights and you don't have to justify yourself, the other one who doesn't want that you do it, he has to justify why he is doing that. So um, how can you put things in practice? Uh, the first thing is speak. Uh, that uh, the lowest level is private conversation. You can break the ice in group discussions, asking good questions. The second step is write. Write letters to the editor of new newspapers. Every letter stands for a couple of thousand opinions. Um, write to politicians. They always give an answer because they wanted to be re-elected. Um, defend yourself and reject unjustified restrictions and get informed. Um, most Christians do not know what political parties think or what they write or what their election programs are. They just think, oh, this guy is nice and he may be Christian or whatever there is. But many people have no idea what, the, what they have in the programs. And uh, in ma many part uh, political programs are heavily anti-Christian. Uh, establish contact, get to know members of parliament, politicians um, who share their own opinions. And uh, one thing I would recommend is if you have the possibility, adopt a politician, which means um, create a prayer group for a politician, maybe for one politician you know personally, and invite him and ask him what are the topics that are going on. So as a community, as a congregation or, or church, you can send out a politician. Um, and you can strengthen him or her, and you can uh, inform and support each other. So this is a win-win concept that strengthens the church and also strengthens, uh, strengthens the politician. Um, become socially and politically active, permeate society in bodies, in committees, in parties, wherever God leads you. So use situations and open doors. Um, I think one of the best examples may be Daniel in Babylon. God put him in a very in, in, to Babylon in the exile, but in a very high position. He was one of the most high uh, officials in this country, and certainly he had a big influence on this country. So if a door opens and God shows you, okay, this is the way you can go, just do it and go for it. 
So we have to penetrate society with the gospel. And of course, we always have to leave others the freedom of how to respond. But what should be um, uh, true for us is that we can't stop talking about what we have heard and seen. Some people can, but we should, uh, we, we should be able to talk about what we have heard and seen, of course. Now, society is being shaped, if not by us, then only by others. That's just a matter of fact. So come to the conclusion. We are on the crossroads between freedom and chaos. There's a critical, I think there's a critical transition period. In many countries, the formal law is still on the side of Christian freedom, but the understanding of law, the practice and the social mainstream is not. I think we all know that. The ultimate alternative in my view is that we have a free or open society as Karl Popper would call it, we have a free society with equal rights and dignity for everybody, or we go into a closed society where freedom and dignity depend on, depend on conditions. And these conditions are defined by a government that thinks to have ultimate normative knowledge to control the life of all in many or all details. So there are two ways to go. One way is a way to pass to utopia. And this utopia has historically been proven to be a nightmare of bondage, dictatorship, murder, decline, and ultimate chaos. And the other is a new spiritual reformation with the goal of restoring freedom. So it's never too late um, to, uh, to get active. And I hope I could motivate you uh, to think about these two paths and see what God calls you maybe to do. So with that, thank you very much for your attention, for the resources, see the outline uh, of the talk or the books at the Professoran Forum. Thank you very much.